Welcome in to another episode of the CHGO Fire Podcast, presented by Coors Light, the official domestic beer partner of Chicago Fire FC, Chicago Choose to Chill. Go to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Soccer to get Coors Light delivered straight to your door. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. And we've got a lot to talk about on this week's episode of CHGO Fire. Of course, there was the disappointing loss in Columbus, the crazy windy nonsense game against Montreal over the weekend. But first and foremost, it is U.S. Open Cup week. And on Wednesday night, Chicago Fire 2 will take on Chicago City SC in the opening round of the tournament. And there is nobody better to talk to about that game on Wednesday night than CF2 head coach Ludo Tayandier. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on CHGO Fire. Thank you for having me, guys. Very happy to be here with you. Yeah, great to have you. I guess first, before we get into some of the details, yes, this is a big game for your players, but how excited are you and your staff? How big of a deal is tomorrow night's game for you guys? Uh, yeah, it is very, very exciting for uh, yeah for the players, but also for us as a staff, for sure. It's uh, It was not something we expected to, to do, uh, uh, honestly, a few months ago. Then, yeah, we represent the, the CD, the club, uh, the club that won four already. Then it's a, it's a competition that's... Uh, Definitely uh, important in the in this club, and uh, you know, it's uh, we are very very honored and excited to represent the, the city and the club. Yeah. On that note, when when you guys find out that it's definitely going to be CF two, that your group, your largely very young group, is going to be the team representing the fire in the Open Cup, what was the reaction of the team of the players when they got that news? It's uh, they are ecstatic. Uh, they are extremely excited, as you as you imagine. Uh, like you said, uh, we have players uh, all the way from 15 years old to 25 years old. We also we also have uh, some first team players that will help. Uh, that that will be a mix, uh, a puzzle of, of different kind of backgrounds. Then we have uh, potentially the players that played less than 15 minutes average with the first team that can also help with us. Then we plan to have some uh, somewhere like four players from the first team also joining uh, for tomorrow's game. Yeah, no, that would be extremely exciting. And I do want to talk more about that balance in a moment. But for for the guys who are rostered as Chicago Fire 2 players, what kind of opportunity do you think this presents for them, obviously being a different sort of showcase than their week-to-week matches? Yeah, no, that, that's a, definitely a, a huge exposure. Um, it's also... Um, as as we can win games, more exposure. Then it's uh, it's it's very it's it's a big deal. It's a big deal for the for the club for the for the players. We have definitely players also that will uh, that will face a uh, different kind of uh, an exposure in terms of the media, in terms of uh, how important it is. Um, the the players, their families. Uh, definitely, we expect some uh, some people to come to to see the, the the games a little more than what we have in our league. In general, then that's uh, definitely uh, something way more exciting than anything else we have this year. I'll plug this again at the end, but yes, uh, tickets are free at SeatGeek tomorrow night. Parking is free. If you are available, go out, support Ludo's guys in the Open Cup. Or maybe you're just looking to watch some local soccer in general. They're taking on Chicago City SC tomorrow night at SeatGeek Stadium. So it is a Chicago Derby of sorts. Uh, Ludo, you mentioned that you do have the opportunity to bring in some first-team players. Uh, You said, as is the case, the basic requirement is it can't be anybody who has averaged more than 15 minutes in the opening four MLS matches of the season. Maybe you can't tell me which four or so players you're bringing, but from your position, how do you balance, you know, taking the help of some first-team guys to strengthen the squad versus wanting this to be an opportunity for these young guys who are a constant part of this squad working hard week in and week out? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, we are the second team and we, 
we remain the, the second team uh, tomorrow, then we, we are here to help the first team as a first mission. First objective for us is to give minutes to players that may need minutes to to potentially help the first teams in, in the next uh, league games. Then mm -hmm. that's that's who we are. That's what we are first here to help the first team. Then to answer your question, of course, the first team players have the absolute priority um, to be to be in the lineups in the in the starting eleven, and we uh, and we built around those players with uh, with our younger players. But now definitely the, the first team players are the, the priority for the for the starting eleven. Mm -hmm. So for you and, and your your staff, the team, with the Open Cup, what's the goal? Is the goal to eventually face an MLS first team? Is it to beat a USL championship team? Is it something broader than that? You know, when, when you're talking to the players, what do you guys talk about as, as your goal, not only tomorrow night, but if you're able to win with the tournament in general this year? Well, each time we start a, a, a tournament, we, we are here to win. Of course, it's a... Uh, there is a there is a, the objective is uh, obvious uh, you start something to win it now it's uh, one game at a time of course we uh, then the objective and what we are speaking to the players at the moment is to win the game uh, that we play tomorrow and uh, you know that's uh, that's the way to see it it's a 100 percent focus on the games on the game coming and we'll think about uh, the future later but right now it's a uh, full focus on tomorrow you guys did just begin your MLS Next Pro season the other day. First game of the year under your belt. Um, from a, both a coaching perspective and just the vibe around the team, how would you describe the mood after uh, after Saturday's result? Well, Saturday's uh, result was a good result to start with for us. Uh, we played against Cincinnati there, uh, away. And uh, coming back home with two points out of the three available, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a very good deal. Uh, uh, yeah, and you know, like they were like they were definitely a good team. That we uh, we we felt very very happy with uh, with the two points. That was a, a very intense game. Um, and I would say we are, there are a lot of things we need to work on. That, that just the first game, but for a first game, it was definitely a good first game. Then we are we are positive about the the first game, and uh, the vibes are are good right now. Obviously, there's a lot of guys coming back from last year's team. So those who have fired followed fire two in the past we'll know some names amari glasgow was probably the the headliner of that of guys who people got to know a bit last season i do though want to ask you about two exciting signings the team made in the last week uh christian kofi and david chichao caro uh, kofi coming over from portugal uh chichao caro from benin uh what do you hope these guys can add and bring to the squad <laughs> they are definitely um <clears throat> very uh, very big additions for the roster for us we are, we are building this roster in general with uh, with some academy products mm -hmm. from uh, Chicago fire of course uh, we are building this roster with international uh, players foreigners that can bring uh, an extra an extra push in terms of uh, you know bringing a different culture you are speaking uh, about christian christian coffee is a uh, then he's a french player that uh, definitely uh, Will be very uh, very interesting in uh, in this league. He's a, he's a guy that loves dribbling. Then he comes with a with a little bit of a, of a street culture uh, mm -hmm. that we have. We have a lot of players like that in France, and uh, he's definitely a, an amazing addition for us. He won't play tomorrow. Just arrived. Then we are uh, we are trying to make him uh, fit enough to to play official games. Then he won't be he won't be on the field tomorrow like uh, Chichao won't be also. Chichao same thing. Huh, coming from Africa from uh, Benin. And that's uh, that's also very very exciting to for us to to be able to to expand our uh, uh, all those territories that we we, we want to find good players in. And you know it was not the case before. I think the club is uh, is definitely doing an amazing job as having some scouts, um, mm. pretty much uh, not all over the world, but uh, a little uh, a little more presence in in Africa, in uh, South America, Central America. Then I think we are definitely uh, going the right way. Yeah. Actually, a last question I want to ask you about that. You know, the the expanded scouting network over the past couple of years, particularly expanding into Africa in the last year. We've heard a lot about that. Those of us who are on the team, Che Chow, as you mentioned, is a guy who is coming to the club as a product of that expanded scouting search. As the coach of CF2, what do you kind of view your role as in developing and nurturing these players who are brought into the club and that your team is their first stop? 
for for me it's uh, it's definitely uh, if I had to define a little bit the the job we are doing with uh, with the staff it's definitely uh, develop develop uh, develop players to 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 make sure they can be ready and they can help our first team ultimately uh, when when one of our players is signing a, a professional contract for the first team then we we feel we accomplished our mission that's uh, that's the biggest, uh, the biggest moments for us is when the uh, young players that we had with us is now with the first team and uh, potentially enter the field that soldier field with the first team. They, they are the big emotional moments for us. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to see some of your guys for the first team either because of call-ups or who knows? Maybe this Open Cup run will go long enough that... Uh, there might be some bigger occasions to be planned around. But for now, a reminder, it's tomorrow night, 7 o'clock at SeatGeek Stadium. They take on Chicago City SC. If you can't be at the game in person, you can stream the game live for free on MLSsoccer.com. Ludo Tayandier, thank you so much for your time today, for joining CHGO Fire. And good luck tomorrow night as you guys start off in the Open Cup. Thank you so much again for having me. It was a pleasure. Same to you. Thank you again to Ludo. Again, a big exciting opportunity for a lot of those younger guys who make up that CF2 roster. And to his point, maybe we're going to see a few senior players as well. We'll have to keep an eye out tomorrow for that. Momentarily, familiar friend of the show, Guillermo Rivera, will join me to break down the Fire's last two matches. But first, a word from the presenting sponsor of CHG of Fire, Core's light from day-to-day -day annoyances to the big stuff life throws your way. It's easy to get worked up, but there's a better way, a chiller way to go through your day. You can turn a canceled concert into an impromptu night out with friends. Maybe instead of going, you know, into the ocean because it's too cold or the lake in this case, Lake Michigan, you know, see people jumping in there all the time, but maybe it's a better day for volleyball or just hanging out and reading on the beach. You can always choose to chill. And when you choose to chill, Reach for a Coors Light. We do so many events here at CHGO, and Coors Light has been a great part of a lot of them, enriching that experience and helping us chill. There's all sorts of ways to chill. You can do it, of course, at a Chicago Fire game. The Chicago Red Stars have their home opener this weekend. That's an afternoon game. Seems like a great way to chill on a Saturday afternoon to me. And baseball season right around the corner as well. Plenty of options in the sports world this summer for Coors Light to help you chill. When the mountains turn blue, Coors Light is as cold as the Rockies. It's cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged for a smoother finish. When you embrace a chill mindset, it's a good time to choose chill and crack open a Coors Light. Coors Light is a mountain cold refreshment, crisp and refreshing as the Colorado Rockies. When you choose to rise above it all, choose chill, choose Coors Light, official domestic beer partner of Chicago Fire FC. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to ch excuse me by going to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Soccer. That's CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Soccer. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Hey, Alex, chill out, man. I do, I do need to chill out. I mean, I, if I, I could use a Coors Light, but for reasons we don't need to get into on the podcast, not exactly a great option for me personally. <laughs> CHGO Fire is also brought to you by CD1 Price Cleaners. With low prices, customers can save over 30% on their dry cleaning bill by switching to CD1 Price. Of course, though, dry cleaning, not all you can do through CD1 Price Cleaners. They also do wash and fold laundry. They'll take your blankets, comforters, your larger items. They do tailoring. They do alterations. They can clean leather. They can clean area rugs. They can do it all. And every item you bring to CD1 Price Cleaners is one same price. No upcharges, no different prices each time you visit. Always the same experience, the same great experience when you use CD1 price cleaners. They also have fast turnaround times. No need to wait a week to pick up your order. And you can sign up for text alerts so you know exactly when your order is ready for pickup. So visit chgo.cd1.com. That's chgo.cdone.com. The link is in the show description. Once there, you can pick from an in-store coupon or online pickup and delivery coupon options. Thank you to Coors Light and CD1 Price Cleaners. And thank you to Guillermo Rivera, our old friend of the podcast here, a man who is, I guess we can say, Chicago Fire beat writer emeritus, who is always willing to ch chime in and opine on all things fire. Guillermo, thanks so much for being here. Great to have you back on the show. 
Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, good to be actually here after a victory. Yeah, I know, and we'll, we'll get to this. You and I were texting midway through that uh, that Montreal game, w- wondering what the uh, the tenor of this show today was going to be, and then that all changed, like many things in that game, very, very quickly. We are going to start in chronological order because we at least have to touch on Chicago Fire 1, Columbus Crew 2, at Lower.com Field in Columbus. Um, Guillermo, it's four games into the season, and it feels like the Fire have played 10 of these games already where things magically slip from their hands. This was uh, this was kind of the perfect, sad Fire game from recent history. It really had it all. Yeah, and, and the, you know, they played fairly well, reasonably well against uh, on the road against the defending champions. So uh, it, it was kind of disappointing, I think, from the team standpoint to get into – extra time and have that amount of time allotted for something bad to happen. And you, you almost felt like a something here is going to happen that uh, goes against the, it goes against them. And certainly it did. Although as everybody listening, I'm sure knows, and we'll get into that. They very much got the opposite side of the mysterious extra time coin a few days later. As you mentioned, Guillermo, the fire played reasonably well. We kind of wondered everybody around this team would they sit back and try to absorb the pressure or would they just try to play their game and take it to the crew? And it was very much the latter. They kind of went toe to toe out there with those guys. And, you know, Wilfred Nancy's team plays some very lovely soccer, but pretty much canceled out in the first half. Uh, second half, though, things really started to get interesting. Fire give the ball away two minutes in. Chris Brady makes a huge save. And this was a big night for Chris Brady because he's up against in the other goal, Patrick Schulte, who is likely his competition for the starting job at the Olympics this summer. So Chris Brady picked a good night to have a good night. Yeah. Like I said, the first half was, there wasn't a whole lot from either team. Um, you know, Columbus had been playing twice a week for champions cup, mm-hmm. like the previous opponents. So um, a little bit of an advantage for the fire going around, seeing that they're, they're playing a, a, a squad that's had to play two games a week to start the season. So um, it was a good opportunity to go in there and get a point and almost did. Yeah, um, and as far as how we got to that point, uh, 67th minute, Ugo Kuyper hits the post. Uh, that close, that close to his first goal of the season. And of course, mere seconds after that ball hits the post, the ball is in the net at the under end of the field for Russell Rowe. Crew break down the fire's midfield, huge amount of space. To, to be a Sahlquist just keeps backing up and backing up and backs up some more. Nobody steps. Russell Rowe, easy finish, bottom corner, 1-0 Columbus. And again, this is just the classic fire sinking feeling of we were so close to a very important goal, and then instead it's 1-0 the other way. Right. That's almost textbooks fire over the last <laughs> how many seasons that uh, you hit the post on one side and you come right back down the other end and it's in the net. That's just uh, the way things have gone for a good majority of the last 10 years or so. Yeah, no, that's very true. Although it then flipped right the other direction because within two minutes the fire scored. And it's 1-1. Uh, this was initially ruled offside, but overturned. Good ball of movement. A very nice ball from Jordan Shakiri Gets Marion Haile Selassie in behind. That just seems to be the fire's route one of attack in general is have Marin be very fast and run in behind defenses. Not a bad option. He squares it for Fabian Herbers. Herbers taps in. 1-1. And I think that's a, a good combination of guys who over the last couple of years, Guillermo, who have been some of the more common bright spots. And and Fabi just continues to be that right place, right time guy who's just willing to do whatever it takes to keep himself in the team and to keep the fire in games. Yeah, I think we've talked about that before. Herbers is a solid MLS player that will um, produce when he's given the chance. He may not be a guy that you want to see uh, on the field, you know, starting 34 games a season for, for uh, for a top flight Uh, side in MLS, but he's a guy who will produce um, when given the chance. No, absolutely. And we've seen Fabi playing a few times. I think he's started three of the four games in that double pivot. um, You know, these last couple of games alongside Kellen Acosta, and maybe there's a nice partnership building there. Um, As, as we mentioned, there's a ridiculous amount of stoppage time. You're waiting for the bad thing to happen. And we think the bad thing happens in the ninth minute of stoppage time. When Columbus looked to have scored the winner after more bad fire defense on a cross to the back post, deja vu if you are a fire fan, but the offside flag goes up, rules out the goal, so it's like, okay, that that was scary, but it's 1-1, the fire are about to get a very, very good point. 
on the road. Uh, there were 12 minutes of stoppage time in this second half, so we were not <laughs> done yet. Uh, the fire fall asleep on a throw-in. Another thing we have seen far too much of with this team. Suddenly, it's a 5 4 from 30 yards out for the crew. Chris Brady makes a decent save on the initial shot, but then Mohamed Farsi rolls in the rebound. Columbus wins. Stadium goes crazy. Yeah, it's it's just... that I think this one hit particularly hard, not only because of the opponent, but because you thought you had dodged that final bullet. Yeah, and again, like you said, it's uh, inattention during a throw-in, which we've seen <laughs> countless times over the last few seasons. Uh, you know, that offside... Uh, goal called back for Columbus kind of made you think of the Philadelphia game where they had uh, a couple of goals, I think, called back uh, after review. Uh, so you think, oh, maybe they'll escape here with a point. But uh, like I said, that uh, uh, sort of a classic fire end where uh, something you're waiting for something to go wrong and it does. So something goes wrong. We would then go into the weekend, which we will talk about next, wondering Will they respond? Will there be some sort of jolt? Will this, ins- or will this instead be the beginning of of some lack of confidence? And boy, did Saturday's game have it all! But first, a couple more words from the people who make this show possible: Prize Picks. Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and we are the- where they are the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it's just you against the numbers instead of facing off thousands of players including sharks and worrying about if you know certain odds are being moved on you or if you're playing fair you can pick more or less on anywhere between two and six player stat projections and then watch the winnings roll in it is basketball conference tournament season no better time than to download prize picks and get in on the daily fantasy game than right now you know, you know, starting Thursday, it's going to be just nonstop basketball going on every day. Lots of chances to win with prize picks, and you can be part of the action for both men's and women's college basketball over the next month. Prize picks also offers weekly promotions that can lead to even bigger payouts, like Taco Tuesday promotions, where prize picks discount select players' projections up to 25%, and you can get even more value. We are loving our partnership here at CHGO with prize picks, and we love that. You know, they've gotten us in on their action and made Daily Fantasy a bigger part of what we do around here. I know a lot of us wish we had gotten into Price Picks sooner, and we are so glad to have them as a partner. So go to prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Meanwhile, here at CHGO, talk all the time about all the great events we have going around on around here, and it is about to be baseball season. MLB opening weekend is nearly upon us, and we will be hosting our CHGO White Sox home opener at Ballpark Pub and the away home opener for the Cubs at the Country Club. So head to the events page at allchgo.com for upcoming events and all details. A reminder. And Alex, you can do both. You can do both. Sox is early. Cubs is late. Make it a day. Let's make it a day and a night. You can make it a day of CHGO baseball. Hopefully get a couple wins. I know the White Sox show may be a bit more nervous than the Cubs show about how easy those yeah. are going to be to come by this season. Like Garrett Crochet. Everything's great. Yeah, I mean, Garrett Crochet, <laughs> let's at least let's enjoy watching him throw as many 100-mile-hour fastballs as he can until his arm falls off. That will at least be more entertaining than a lot of White Sox <laughs> games this season. When you go to allchgo.com, though, you won't just see all our great events. You'll see the podcasts and live shows, every team, every day, packed morning until night, including post-game shows for some of the teams, premium written content for members at allchgo.com. And if you become a diehard member, you get 20% off all events. There's dope merch for all teams, including a free t-shirt when you sign up as a diehard member. If you're watching on YouTube, there's our Chicago collection that launched a couple weeks ago. Super excited to get my pizza hoodie in the mail, hopefully soon. You also get access to the Members Only Lounge, our Discord. When you become a diehard member, we've got channels dedicated to every team where you can talk with us, all the CHGO staff, as well as your fellow fans about everything going on in Chicago sports. And again, be sure to check out that Chicago collection, the newest merch Oof. on CHGO. It could be some of our freshest merch. It is literally the freshest merch we have. But I mean, like, freshest as in cool. Dope. 
I mean, I guess both work. It yeah. is it is fresh and yeah. that it is cool. It is also yeah. fresh and that it is new. Exactly. So go check that out. AllCHGO.com or is it CHGOLocker.com? Uh, CHGOLocker.com. But of course, if you go to AllCHGO.com, you can just click on merch and you can find it by team or by item, whatever, whatever. whatever. We got all kinds of good stuff. Even glassware. Who knew? If, yeah, who knew? Shout out to Lawrence yeah, uh, keeping my, helping me keep the website straight. It's, uh, it's a yeah, lot it's of information. Good. All right, Guillermo, let's get to the fun. Let's get to the chaos. Let's get to whatever the hell that was on Saturday afternoon at Soldier Field. Chicago Fire 4, CF Montreal 3, or as I insist on having to call them, Club de Foot Montreal 3. Trois. There you go. Yeah, it was like a, I don't know, my French is terrible. Um, again, shout out to Ludo earlier for yeah. putting up with my awful pronunciation of his last name, I'm sure. I did the best I can. Um, the Fire make no changes to their lineup, Guillermo. It's the exact same 11 that lost in heartbreaking fashion to Columbus. Would they respond to that late letdown? No, they absolutely would not. Within 12 minutes, they are down 2-0 on two penalties. A late step from Chase Gasper, a Tobias Salquist running into the back of a Montreal attacker who was putting on the brakes as hard as he possibly could, but, you know, that's just Wiley striker play to draw the foul. Um, how would you describe the mood around this game at this point where the fire have, before maybe some people at Soldier Field have even gotten to their seats, are two goals down? Yeah, the start of that game was very disappointing. Did not play well, did not look good at all. It, it almost looked like they were unprepared uh, for the match. It just, uh, you immediately think, oh, here, here we go again. You know, this is a, a game that really was a a must-win game against an Eastern Conference opponent that may be in the same boat you are as in terms of trying to land one of those um, five through nine playoff spots. And they just came out, and Montreal took it to them. They were in command of that game almost, uh, not from the start, but yet from the start, but uh, all the way up until probably the 84th minute or so. Um, a very disappointing start to that game. Just uh, hard to imagine why uh, they came out so flat. Yeah, and it was just a weird half in general. It goes on still being to nothing, you know. And then at the end, you know, this is kind of a uh, an omen of things to come. A large amount of stoppage time is put on the board at the end of cartoonish the- amount of stoppage time. Ridiculous. Yeah, uh, ten minutes of added time. Ten minutes of added time in the first half. That I mean, there were two goals and two penalties. One of which included a VAR review, so you expected more than usual, but I think most of us watching were probably like, yeah, I don't know, six, something in that range would be about right. Nope, it's 10, and with that, the fire score, or do they? Um, the goal is scored by Marin Holly Selassie, again, running in behind, a ball over the top. It's a nice finish, but um, he was absolutely offside, and the officials I just agree with you. flat out missed it and then also didn't review it? I'm, I'm just... Very, very confused. It was mind-boggling because uh, you, at first glance, you thought, oh, oh this is probably going to come back. And it seemed like there was not a review. It just <laughs> immediately went to restarting the game. It was, yeah, you, I, you're I at least waiting for the camera shot where the referee touches his ear and tells right. yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and tells the people taking the kickoff to just, let's just wait a minute. Even if we don't have any video of this, let's just at least confirm that the VAR people have thought about it and like considered the possibility. No, none of that game no, continued. No. Halftime whistle got blown almost immediately. Two on fire, whatever, shake it off. You're only down one and a half after 45 minutes of pretty mediocre soccer, so you will take it. We should also note, this is CF Montreal's fourth straightaway game to start the season. They had right. won all of them so far because they have a very weird stadium situation where normally they play the middle, I'll say the middle 70% of their season at Stade Saputo, which is a purpose-built soccer stadium, but is outdoors in Montreal. It's quite cold in the spring and in the fall. So normally what they do instead is they play a couple games at the beginning of the year and the end of the year at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal, but the Stade Olympique is currently undergoing renovations, so it isn't available. They will play two more away games before they play at home. So they've been road warriors, CF Montreal. This has not been odd for them to look good on the road. Um, Carlos Tehran, who's been rehabbing from injury, replaces Tobias Salquist at halftime. Uh, the Dane defender has not looked great. I mean, I think he's probably still getting used to his partnership with Rafael Shihos. He's still getting to know his teammates, the league, but a bit of a rough start there. So Tehran comes on. Uh, first 20 minutes of the half pass without incident. And hey, look, the fire get beat by a quick throw in. 
again. It's followed by some very nice soccer by Montreal. Joseph Martinez, yes, he plays for Montreal now. That's That might be like news to you. ATL, Uni- Atlanta United's Joseph Martinez? Atlanta United and briefly Inter Miami's Joseph Martinez. Yeah, wow. he was, uh, Joseph maybe the, I don't know if he was the first salary dump that Miami had to make this offseason to wow. afford all their new toys. But yeah, he was one of the guys sacrificed so that Messi could bring more friends. But I suppose if you have the choice to sign Luis Suarez or keep an aging Joseph Martinez, I get it. Uh, so Martinez, beautiful little back heel. Yanko into the wide open net. It's 3-1, and Guillermo, 20 minutes to go. This game, at this point, feels over. Yeah, it, it felt over. It looked like it was over. Um, it, you know, we were talking about Montreal on the road, and that made it even more important for them to um, win this game because you have to win home games in MLS if you're going to qualify for even the ninth playoff spot. And up until this point, it looked like uh, another home game that was going to go uh, with zero coming out of it. Yeah, and that would be tough, especially given this being the second home game of the season, uh, the tough way which they lost to Cincinnati at home, coming off that Columbus game. Montreal, though they've been good this year, have not been a good team, um, you know, a lot the last few years. So when you're at the beginning of the season, a couple months ago, looking at the schedule, this feels like the sort of game you circle. And then things just get incredibly, incredibly weird, and they do so very, very quickly. Um, Fire make a few attacking subs because they are trailing by two goals. This ends up with uh, Ugo Kuipers, Georgios Kutsias, and Tom Barlow all on the field together at the same time. Um, Raheem Edwards is sent off with a straight red card in the 82nd minute for a foul literally nobody saw. I didn't see it until... Yeah, I didn't see it until the... uh, MLS YouTube instant replay segment yesterday where they managed to get a view way zoomed in and grainy though it was of after some hand checking between Edwards and Kuypers waiting for a cross Edwards who of course used to play for the fire just throws an elbow straight into Kuypers gut and I think the reason no one noticed is because Kuypers just doesn't react like at all his abs just take it and the play goes on and then everybody, including the fire is left confused. I think the only person who seemed to notice was Kutsias who then when Edwards is looking bewildered, does a nice little elbow motion saying, Hey, I saw what you did there. So, so that was um, very, very, very weird. And also Edwards did this in the penalty area during open play. So it's also a PK, which Brian Gutierrez scores. Shakiri's off the field at this point. So Goody takes the PK. And so now there's eight minutes left it's three to two, and I believe the, the commentator said, well, now, well, now, and it did feel that way. Like, suddenly, this game that was deader than dead is now entirely alive because of incredibly confusing circumstances. Yeah, the, the camera work and not having an angle of what happened made it even more confusing, and even looking at it afterwards, you're, okay, maybe it's a foul in the box, but a red card is pretty generous. So at that point, uh, you're starting to see the fire get the benefit of some of these calls. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that again, sure, in a couple of minutes. But that that brought that gave them life. Yeah, and again, in and generally, as many fans will know, there is a double jeopardy rule in place that is that takes a lot of would be red cards in the box and turns them into yellows because of you know that's the double penalty of losing a player and likely conceding a goal. This isn't included in that though because that clause only applies if the red card foul is committed in the act of trying to win the ball. The ball is 40 yards away when this happens, so that rule does not apply here. This is just a really, really weird occurrence. Um, we'll, we'll see if Montreal appeal the penalty of a three-game automatic suspension. We should also mention Chris Brady should have been sent off in this game like 20 minutes before this for handling the ball outside the area. Uh, Montreal gets a guy in behind. Brady slides out. It definitely hits his arm. And I don't think it was in the act of supporting him at the time. It was kind of just trailing behind the body. So this game gets increasingly weird. That Edwards red card required a long VAR check. So wait for it. Nine minutes of added time at the end of the second half. um, As uh, Fire Radio play-by-play commentator Max Toma texted me after this game. These 55 minute halves are killing me. So this this game was this game was all of 110, 115 minutes. Um, so in the 90th plus five, Hugo Kuipers gets his first goal for the fire. This is such a fox in the box goal. And Guillermo, I think, kind of embodies my opinion of 
just get this guy the damn ball in the box. He's going to score goals if you just get him the ball. Yeah, it, it seems like that is what he's best at. Like he did box in a box, most of what uh, we've seen from him um, in his career, at least via highlights, because I've you know, I, I got to confess I didn't see a whole lot of Hugo Kuypers before coming here. Um, but right. it seems like most of his goals are uh, touches in the box where he finds a way to be in the right place at the right time. And certainly that's uh, that was the case here. So it's 3-3, and you're thinking, okay, surely that's it. Again, much like the Columbus game, you're midway through stoppage time thinking a bullet's been dodged. They're going to get out of here with a weird point. Everybody move on move on with your lives. 90th plus 7, it sure looks like Kutsius is maybe about to win it, and a great save is made by Silwa. Um, Kuypers and Barlow are both furious at him because they are both standing on the line of the six-yard box looking for a tap-in that never materialized. And then... Time's winding down. We are in the ninth minute of a minimum of nine minutes added on. And we're going to put a picture up here for the YouTube audience of where Kellen Acosta has this ball. And a reminder that a, a soccer field is 60 yards to the center. So this is fully 66, 67 yards from the end line and a little off center. So you're looking at, this is 70 yards from ball to goal at this point. And um, I imagine everybody who is listening and watching saw the goal. But if you weren't or didn't, um, this ball goes in the back of the net. This this goes in for the winning goal. It's an assist technically to Chris Brady, uh, technically his first of his entire professional career. So uh, that's fun. Wind aided, windy city jokes abound. And I was saying to somebody in the office, this is the one time I will not be that pedantic guy who corrects somebody on why it's called the windy city and it's not about the weather. I'm letting it go this time because... I don't know if the fire have ever had a viral moment like this. Like I'm getting texts from people who don't care about soccer asking me about this goal, just which in itself is as weird as this entire game was. I saw someone refer to or kind of compare it to a cheap wind blown home run in the basket at Wrigley field. And that's pretty much what it was. A wind blown home run into the basket. Yeah. Just, uh, I think on, on Twitter, I called it a, uh, a, logo three at the buzzer because that's kind of what this feels like like a very caitlin I mean, clark pull logo, up jumper no that's like from the yeah, other behind like the logo. 80 feet that was that's like an <laughs> insane it's completely insane yeah uh, and so then a bunch of really fun stats shout out to the mls communications department came out about this game uh chris brady's like the youngest goalkeeper to ever record an assist in mls play the fire are the first team to trail by two goals in the 83rd minute and win outright in MLS history. Uh, those are the two latest goals in a win ever in MLS history. It's just nothing about this made any sense whatsoever. And I've seen a few people just defer to this quote. This is what Kellen Acosta had to say about it because I think he's the only person we can ask. Quote, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, to be honest. I think that was Chris Brady's first assist, so congrats to Chris. I mean, for me, it was just about getting the ball in the mix zone, basically, and create some things. I've had some balls I've found at the back post, and if I'm being fully transparent, that's what I try to do again. This time, though, I had some St. Patrick's Day luck. The wind was able to take it, and for me, it was one of those things that when it left my foot, I was almost upset with myself, like, dang, I kind of blew an opportunity. Then I realized it might have a chance. Saw the keeper take two steps, and I'm like, this really might have a chance, and yeah, I mean, he came out, went over his head, rest is history. Excited for my first goal at the club, more excited for the win, which is also the 50th win for Frank Klopas as manager. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to dwell here a minute, Guillermo, on Kellen Acosta, because obviously this goal is a signature moment and is going to go down in fire history no matter how this season goes. He just seems like he is that dude. It's hard to remember a guy who's come into this club with the attitude he's brought, with the the seriousness, the experience, and just the genuine excitement and eagerness to do whatever he can to make things better. I mean, I, I, I struggle to remember a player who has endeared themselves to fans more quickly than Colin Acosta has. Well, he's a professional MLS midfielder. That's why he's part of the U.S. men's national team um, uh, roster. That, that's why he was on LAFC last year, and that's... Uh, He's a guy who, like you said, he's a, he's, a, he's a winner. He's been a proven winner, and he brings that attitude with him, which is uh, something the Fire had sort of lacked. And you know, we're talking about this crazy goal, but uh, the Fire had probably been way overdue for something completely oh insane to happen in their favor because it seems like whenever something just uh, 
random or chaotic happens, it's usually uh, uh, they're on the receiving end. And hey, if the referee's strike randomly is resolved this week, I think uh, Cal Nacosta and the Fire can also claim credit for that because there was other calls this weekend that were weird, but I mentioned the MLS soccer instant replay segment. The whole video, I think, of reviews from the weekend was like seven and a half minutes long. Fully three of it was about this game and just um, Mm -hmm. host Andrew Wiebe disagreeing with literally every controversial call that was made that was like up for debate in this game. It was just a complete horror show of refereeing performance. But to your point, the fire don't get that kind of luck often. This is not a thing that happens to the fire. Another thing I believe I tweeted was this is the thing that happens to the fire. This is not the thing the fire do. So shout out to the fans who went out to a pretty chilly and extremely windy St. Patrick's Day weekend, Soldier Field, and got rewarded by getting to see one of the absolute craziest goals of all time. Got a comment here from Jess Nav 21 Saw this goal from the supporters section. The bend that ball took was crazy. Yeah, there's a video going around. Um, John Dean, no, not that one, not the one who plays right back. He's a, you might know him as the guy who wears a fire jersey around with the Herald's chicken logo on the front of it. Uh, He posted a video online. Go look that up. Of you can see the bend. The bend is fully 40 yards. It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. And again, shout out to everybody like Jess who was there to witness it. It was definitely worth whatever you paid and foregoing the chaos that is downtown Chicago on the Saturday of St. Patrick's Day weekend. Fire supplied plenty of that chaos themselves. Um, we also saw Guillermo last week, uh, uh, Juran Shakiri get called a quote black hole of creativity. Uh, online. Uh, He's not going to be with the team this next weekend against the Revolution. Big, big opportunity for Brian Gutierrez, who uh, we assume will step into that role. Yeah, and that may not be a bad thing. They seem to play better with Shakiri off the field. I think I referred to him as an $8 million anchor on uh, on Saturday, but uh, like I said, it's a big opportunity for Gutierrez to show that he can play in that role. Um, I think that's that uh, sort of number 10 um, the realization of a number 10, not just wearing the jersey, is probably what is missing from uh, mm-hmm. this fireside. I, I think um, bringing in Kuypers uh, without really any, I think uh, they were near the bottom of MLS in terms of uh, uh, passes in the in the final third or effective passes. Yeah, the in chance the final creation last year. terrible. Yeah, and, and you bring in a guy like Kuypers with that. Uh, sort of set hanging over your head and you know he's going to have some difficulty getting uh service and it, it, that for the most part been the case this year he hasn't really gotten um the ball at his feet in the dangerous area at any point really uh, until that uh, crazy finish um they, they've tried getting him the ball over the top which seems kind of uh, not what he's best at <laughs> um, but yeah I, I think the fire need uh, someone who can uh, get the ball forward and get the ball in the box to find Kuypers where uh, in dangerous areas uh, because Shakiri doesn't really do that. And that's, uh, that's, he's not been that guy throughout his whole career and he's not that guy here. It's very true. And it's also a big opportunity for Guti, not only because Shakiri is gone. There's an Olympics this summer and Guti plays in a position at the youth level that the U S men's national team are kind of blessed with a lot of guys who can do a similar thing to what Guti does. Chris Brady just got called in yesterday as an injury replacement to join up with the team over in Europe. So those guys have an opportunity to play for their country this summer. Um, Brian Gutierrez and Sergio Orejel actually featured yesterday in the kit launch video for the new U.S. soccer kits for the year. That was awesome to see. So I think Guti is fully aware of what he is playing for, not just next week, but the rest of the season. Speaking of next week, upcoming schedule for the Fire before we get out of here. Of course, Wednesday night is the Open Cup, Chicago Fire 2 against Chicago City at SeatGeek Stadium. Also in the Chicago Metro in the Open Cup that same night, Chicago House take on Minnesota United 2 at Elmhurst University out in the West Suburbs. For the Fire senior team, the next two are both on the road. That is Saturday at New England, 1 p.m. back-to-back afternoon games for the Fire. And then make it three in a row, Easter Sunday, March 31st, 2.30 at Atlanta United. A couple big road tests. A big chance for some points this weekend. New England are 0-4. Who knows? Maybe that really terrible tea crate bit just has cursed them and they are paying the consequences. 
Guillermo, thanks so much again for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure to have you and always appreciate your insight. I'm sure we'll see you again later in the season. Anytime, Alex. And thanks, of course, again to Ludo for checking in, telling us about CF2 as they get ready for the Open Cup tomorrow night. Again, 7 p.m. SeatGeek Stadium, also streaming live on MLSsoccer.com. Also very exciting, right after this on CHGO YouTube, and if you are listening wherever you get your podcasts, CHGO Red Stars, our first episode of the year, is coming up next today. Be sure to tune in for that as well. For now, I'm Alex Campbell. This has been the CHGO Fire Podcast, and I'll see you next time. We all silly like the mayor. 